This episode of Two Beers Till Takeoff is sponsored by No Days Wasted, a leader in the hangover supplement industry. Listeners can now get 15% off their next purchase by using promo code 2BEERS, that's 2BEERS, BEERS in capital, at checkout. Live life or your next trip to the maximum with No Days Wasted. Hello and welcome to Two Beers Till Takeoff, the podcast inspired by conversations overheard at the airport bar. Join Phil as he grabs a couple of beers and chats with interesting people from around the world, sharing expert knowledge and hilarious stories that you won't find in your guidebook. So pull up a stool and get ready for an adventure as we explore worlds of travel and beyond with Two Beers Till Takeoff. Four hours in a Taliban headquarters. I had dog meat in Laos. Was it a golden retriever? Smack a dirty old smooch <laughs> on our beautiful fish right here. We didn't die, but we fell down the side of the mountain. Hello, and welcome to Two Beers Till Takeoff. My name is Phil, and I just wanted to say welcome to all the new listeners that have joined the community. I've seen, you know, the views have gone considerably up uh, in the last uh, few weeks. So just wanted to say welcome to everybody who's new here. Uh, If you haven't already, make sure to connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, or TikTok. And also, if you have a second, I'd greatly appreciate you leaving a review of the show and a comment if you can. You know, it takes a few seconds and it greatly benefits the show. So I really uh, appreciate that. Thank you in advance. Now, let's talk travel. This episode will be a bit different to the other episodes that we've or that I've put out before. If you're a beginner traveler looking to make the leap to your first backpacking trip or if you're a backpacker and just want a calendar of cool festivals around the world, you're going to love this episode. It can be frustrating to go to a country with an awesome festival and when you get there, you realize you just missed it. So my mix of festivals is going to be some of the better known ones around the world and some of the lesser known ones that you haven't heard of yet. So I decided to showcase some of these festivals because in my experience of when I've traveled, I really value going to a country to see what their normal day-to-day looks like, but I find that cultures really flourish during festivals. People look forward to these events all year, and you can just see that the the population is just overwhelmingly happy, and uh, this is just something that I think more people should experience. And target when they're traveling. So I'm featuring a festival around the world every month of the year. So let's start with January. A cool event I found for January is a festival called Edit. I don't know if that's how you say it. It's E-D-D-E-T, which is an Ethiopian Christmas that takes place from January 6th to 7th every year. The main celebration takes place around a church in Lalibela, which has been dubbed Africa's Petra. Petra being one of the seven wonders of the world has to be beautiful, right? Thousands of pilgrims draped in white gowns gather around the 13th century rock-cut churches for an evening of celebrations. On the eve of Christmas, Ethiopian Christians line up surrounding the church and begin a long, looping procession for hours. It's, it's, it's interesting because it, it reminds me a bit of like what Mecca is, but this is a, a Christian uh, holiday. Typically, this experience starts at 6 p.m. and ends at 3 a.m. Insane. I guess younger me having to go to church for Christmas has nothing to complain about. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, ki- I'm kidding. But, you know, this, this sounds super cool and I'd really love to experience that. I, I think it'd be really uh, a really neat experience in, uh, I mean, we, we, we don't, uh, I guess for myself, I don't know much, I guess, about Ethiopia, but this this is definitely something that I, I think I would target and go check out. Uh, so that's January, January checkout edit. Are you looking for an alternative from Mardi Gras? So this festival that I'm going to be uh, showcasing has been labeled as one of the wildest parties in the world. It's the last hurrah before the 40 days of Lent. So the date changes, so it can be in early March, but mainly it occurs in February. And instead of featuring the most popular one in Rio, in Brazil, for February, I'm going to Salvador de Bahia for Carnival. So music, dancing, costumes, drinking, and debauchery is what people can expect. How does Salvador's carnival differ from Rio's carnival, you might ask? 
Well, Salvador's version honors the large Afro-Brazilian community's history and culture. And also, this is a, a big feature. It does not feature uh, samba dancing, which is a traditional Brazilian dance. So go to Salvador to experience these large parades during the day and night. And obviously, you know, if you're going to Brazil, you need to be a bit careful. Uh, I know that you guys have heard some of the stories that happened in Salvador uh, with Sid and myself. You know, the story of him and I are nearly getting stabbed uh, for our McDonald's. If you haven't, go check out the the Brazil episode. Some areas in of Brazil can be sketchy, so you need to keep your cool when you're down there and use common sense. Have one or two beers less than you planned on and you should be fine. Look, I loved how colorful and vibrant Salvador was when I was there, and I can only imagine what it would be like during the year's biggest party. So guys, Salvador da Bahia for Carnival in February. In March, let's go and do St. Patrick's Day. No, not in Ireland. Shocker, I know. But instead, let's go to Chicago in the US. The city's river turns green literally during this time. And you can expect parades, great pubs, and festive folks dressed in green, white, and orange. You may be asking, why are you recommending to go to the US for an Irish festival? Well, interestingly enough, back in the 19th century, Irish immigrants literally built this city. Not more than a million local residents claim Irish heritage, and even more claim Irish heritage during St. Patrick's Day, because, well, everybody's Irish during St. Patrick's Day, obviously. Uh, but no, Chicago's a uh, is, is one of my favorite cities in the US. And to go during this time would be so cool. I think uh, Chicago skyline is super picturesque. It's by a lake, so it's 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 so beautiful, and it's also a great sports city to go watch. You know, basketball, college basketball, hockey at this time of the year. So check out St. Patrick's Day in Chicago. All right. So for April, this is the festival that stood out to me. There's there's a lot of festivals in April, but this one stood out to me when I read it because when I read it, I laughed out loud. So. Uh, I might have laughed out loud too because I'm a bit of immature, but the festival is held in a small town in Japan called Kanamara Matsura. Probably nailed that. Uh, the population in this town have an unusual obsession. They worship Kanamata, who according to legend, was once granted special powers by her lover after being badly injured in battle. Though she eventually died from these wounds and closed off access to this mystical power, it lives on through those who still honor her today. And how else would you celebrate this god other than by erecting giant wooden penises all over town as a reminder of her legacy? This festival celebrates the penis, fertility, and good fortune. Also, people from across Japan come to give thanks for protection against sex sexually transmitted diseases. <laughs> oh, fuck. Uh, everybody, I guess you must be thinking the same thing as me, but do they blur out the dicks? Like, is it just like giant pixelated dicks all over town? Hold on, let me Google that, actually. Uh, no, so it, it turns out it's just giant pink dick statues everywhere. And here I have a picture of somebody eating a dick popsicle, so... Yeah. Anyways, that, that that sounds interesting. You know, go to Japan and see a bunch of giant wind dicks. <laughs> All right. So for May, we're going to one that might already be well known, but we're going to Cooper's Hill Cheese Roll. So this is an event where people chase. Uh, chase might not be the right word. More appropriate word might be uh, roll also with the wheel of cheese down a very steep hill in Brockworth, England. The winner is the person who eventually either catches the cheese or makes it down the hill alive first. So for context, the wheel of cheese has been clocked at 70 miles per hour, just detailing, I guess, how steep this hill is. It's fucking insane. I'd heard of this event before, but I watched a documentary on Netflix called The uh, Human Playground, where it showcased some of the athletes competing, and it's pretty crazy. They talk about some of the injuries they sustained during training, and the event itself, its major injuries include stuff like bumps, bruises, concussions, and compound fractures. Wild to think they do all of this for a wheel of cheese. Do my Brits know if, if Gloucester, Gloucester cheese is any good? I mean, if you're willing to, to, to risk compound fractures, it has to be a, a pretty good uh, wheel of cheese. Because the winner ends up with the wheel of cheese. 
Uh, and also a fun fact, anyone can sign up, sign up for this race. So if you're brave enough, go sign up for this in May in Brockworth, England. Sounds sweet. And also, I'm sure a lot of people would give you pity because when you tell them, oh, oh how'd you break your arm? Oh, well, I was uh, running down this hill chasing a, a wheel of cheese. Yeah, they'll definitely give you a lot of pity. That's hilarious. All right, so for June, let's do Midsummer. This is a tradition celebrated in some of the Nordic countries, but mainly Sweden and Finland. Based on my research, I found that there was some celebrations in uh, Denmark and Norway as well, but Sweden and Finland are the only two that actually have the day off for people. It's a, it's a national holiday. Essentially, this is a never ending party involving flowers in your hair, dancing around a pole, eating and singing songs while drinking schnapps. Sounds sweet. The festival celebrates the longest day of the year and the summer solstice. So participants will experience 24 hours of sunlight and parties all day and night. Sounds awesome. I've only heard my fellow Finns talk about this epic party that happens in June and I've been meaning to go ever since. Personally, I've experienced 24 hour sunlight when I used to live in Canada's north, but there's no festivals that can compete with midsummer. There's just a lot less development up there than you know that there would be in, in Sweden and Finland. Uh, and also fun fact, just to kind of detail how wild midsummer can get, there's actually a baby boom nine months later due to all the night activities that go on during midsummer. So get ready for some debauchery and fun in the Nordics this June. All right, so for July, we're going with one I've already covered, but it's an epic one. It's just a can't miss festival. I mean, it's can't miss unless you, you get hurt, but we're going to Pamplona, Spain for running with the bulls. This event originated from the old practice of transporting bulls from the fields outside the city where they were bred to the bull ring where they would be eventually killed in the evening. During this run, local youth would jump among them in a display of bravado, trying to be the tough guys. So just to, I guess, showcase how, how long and how much this has been ingrained in, in uh, Spanish culture, this festival has been around since the 13th century, now hosts thousands of tourists from all over the world. I ran back in 2016 and it was a bucket list bucket list item for me. So here's some quick tips that I, I guess I can share from my experience. So the first thing that you'd want is a good pair of shoes because if the track is wet on cobblestone, it can get really, really slippery. If you fall, make sure to stay down because like I said, there's thousands of people and you may get trampled. So try to roll off to the side or because yeah, if you fall, it's bad news. There's a lot of people running, so be careful. If you're doing it alone, it's early in the morning. Like I, I did it, or, uh, I did it by myself, and I think I would have enjoyed a little sneaky beer before because you're gonna need some liquid courage. It's when you're doing it by yourself, it's fucking terrifying. So I had watched some tape as a good athlete does about their opponent, and I saw that what some bulls had done the days prior was turn around during the race and start bashing the people behind them. So my strategy was to avoid this. And so I wanted to stay ahead of the bulls as much as I could. The bulls start at the bottom of the town. Then they eventually climb up to the to hit the 90 degree turn of dead man's alley. And then they start their ascent towards the stadium. So my strategy was to stay in the middle of the hill between dead man's alley and the stadium and gauge kind of from where where they were when they were going to hit the corner that I could start running and then make it to the stadium and they sh they shouldn't be able to pass me. So it's an, it's an interesting concept that that happens cuz before the race, you know, people are chilling, they're celebrating, they're laughing. Some are still, you know, a little drunk from the night before cuz it's just an all out party for like 10 days. But when the bulls start making their ascent up that hill, everybody's behavior quickly changes. Everybody starts freaking out and running for their lives. Buttholes clench and hearts beat. Before you enter the stadium, the road becomes more narrow. And when I ran through, a guy, when I, when I got into, or just was trying to get into the stadium, a guy in front of me ate shit and I jumped over him. I could hear the bulls right behind me. And when I got into the stadium, I looked back and 
I don't know if it was the person that I jumped over, but there was more people that had fallen. And because of that, there was some bulls that had trampled the people and some bulls had fallen onto the people. It was fucking crazy. I have video of it, so I'll, I'll post it, but it's, it was wild shit. But I would do it again. It was, it was a, a, a really cool experience. So for those that are maybe less adventurous and want to say that you've ran with the bulls, you can literally walk into the stadium as the race starts. This would give you about a two minute head start before the bulls even get there. And you can do it scot-free. But warning though, if you do this, the crowd will boo you in the stadium for not being a real runner with the bulls. But listen, you can still do it. You'll get the best seat in the house for what goes on after, which is essentially the let out some smaller bulls with shaved off horns and it just smokes a bunch of tourists. So it's hilarious. So yeah, like I said, the festival goes on for 10 days and has a run every morning followed by a parade leaving the stadium. Um, at night, you will also experience, uh, you can sign up to go watch the bullfights. We did this and I don't know how I felt about it. It was I mean, it, it's it's a cool experience. Everyone there is is just you know dressed in their white with their little red ribbon or red red um, uh, foulard. Fuck, Frenching out. And um, essentially, they're watching the the, the bullfights. And then I don't know if it's just the fact that when I was there, the guy went to do the kill shot for the for the bull with his sword, and he missed. So it, <laughs> it, it, from what I understand, this isn't normal. But just, yeah, I think there was some unnecessary uh, suffering for the from the bull. But anyways, all to say it was a very interesting experience. Also, just a fun fact, the later it gets in the festival, the bigger the bulls become. So keep that in mind. It can be very dangerous to run, so be careful. And and for those who are like, oh, you know, I, I don't have all this bravado. I don't want to run with the bulls. So... My mom was with me during this uh, experience, and to this day, it was one of her favorite memories. She absolutely loved being part of the parade and just seeing all the costumes. It was an awesome experience that is really immersive. You you know, you join the parades, and it's adrenaline pumping. What a fucking experience. For August, we're going to Candy Baby. Back to episode one of the Two Beers Till Takeoff podcast in Sri Lanka. This festival is the largest Buddhist celebration in the world and draws nearly 1 million people each year. Think about how crazy that is. Think about how small Sri Lanka is, right? Just right here. How small it is and add another million people there. That's crazy. The festival is called Esala Perahera. Probably said that right. Or the Festival of the Tooth. You guys might remember the uh, Temple of the Tooth, right? That That was featured in episode one. So this originates back to the 3rd century BC. 3rd century BC, Jesus. Which is a ritual to request rainfall from the gods. It is thought that the procession begun when the sacred tooth relic of Lord Buddha was brought to Sri Lanka from India. From the pictures, what I've I've seen is something that happens more at night, but people can see dancers in colorful clothing. Elephants are just dressed head to toe, including some with lights. And there's just lights all over the city. And from the pictures, it looks like it's so bright during the celebration that you can literally see it from space. It looks so cool. This was definitely one that's uh, one that stood out that I had not heard about. Oktoberfest during September? That's right. We are going to Munich to drink some liter beers. So how did this festival come about? Well, in 1810, Bavaria's crown prince Ludwig married Princess Therese of Saxony Hildburghausen probably how you say it right and the wedding was celebrated with multiple days of drinking feasting and horse races the event was so successful that it became an annual event nowadays you can do exactly that drink eat sing in your dirndl or lederhosen and have a good old time after you leave the beer hall you'll notice a big hill of passed out tourists which is pretty funny this that's definitely somewhere i'd go if you want to go just see a bunch of passed out people it's 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 a phenomenon i'm telling you if you're a tourist and you're looking for the tourist tent head to hofbrau the highlight of this tent in my opinion is people getting up on tables and chugging their liter beers 
Yeah, a liter. You heard me correctly. That's like, I think like 87 gallons in American. But it's 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 a really interesting process because, or a, a thing that happens because you'll see people uh, cheer for the people that can chug really quickly. But if you suck at chugging, oh my fuck, don't get up because people will throw bread and whatever they have around them because it's 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 a mob mentality it's 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 so crazy don't ask me how i know this but they will kick you out if you smoke cigarettes in the bathrooms uh <laughs> sick, sick times boys uh get some pretzels uh is one of my suggestions I'd, I'd tell you and eat as you go you can get like some chicken and stuff like that during the day while you're there uh, just to avoid the hangover it is a marathon not a sprint and like I said there, you will see the people that thought it was a sprint on the hill passed out. Oh, and if you do go to Germany and miss Oktoberfest, know that there are also spring beer festivals all over Germany. For example, like I went to a Frühlingsfestival in Stuttgart when I lived in Germany. Also something to note, if you're going on the first day, like I, I've, I've, when we went, we went on the first day of, of uh, Oktoberfest and didn't know this. The first day you need to get there at like six in the morning just to get in line to get a chance to get into the tent. You get into the tent, I think maybe around 11 and you don't know, get a table, whatever. And then the festivities start. They do like the honorary first tapping of the keg and they, you know, hand out beer to people and stuff like that. And then the actual sale of, of beer starts. It was a really interesting uh, phenomenon because a lot of people got there at six in the morning hammered. And then by the time that the, the tents opened, they were just like, you could just see it was like a party atmosphere, people crowd surfing, you know, in line, singing, dancing. By the time we hit 11, you could just see people were just on the down and we're just like, oh, like I need beer, I need beer. And, uh, but yeah, after that, after, so just know if you go on the first day, you're only going to get beers around 1130 noon. Uh, so that's just something I would have known and uh, I would have I would have uh, liked to know in advance and also I saw somebody sell a liter beer for 50 euros so bring some beers if you're waiting in line you might pay for your day just by selling a couple beers to some people in line so that's definitely a really good tip all right so for October we are now headed to the Oaxaca region of Mexico Oaxaca turns out to be the best spot to experience Dia de la Muerte, aka the Day of the Dead. So activities run from the end of October to November, so it's still considered October. Uh, and this event is a celebration of life and death, uh, and it's celebrated all over Mexico, not just in Oaxaca, but it, Oaxaca is the spot to do it, apparently. People dress up as skeletons, they drink, they dance, they feast, and play music all over the city. You guys might be seeing a little bit of a theme here, but listen... I love to eat, drink, and listen to music and have a grand old time. Count me in. This sounds like an awesome experience. All right, so for November, there aren't many festivals in November. So let's try this experience. American Thanksgiving. For this one, you may need to know someone to get in on the festivities. It's not like the other festivals that I've showcased where you can kind of just walk on the street and take part of it. This one, you might need to know someone uh, to be invited to the experience i guess so thanksgiving is a celebration of autumn's harvest nowadays families get together they have some turkey gravy stuffing potatoes veggies and pie all sorts of stuff and all the f essentially it's all the foods to get your body nice and ready for winter uh you can go if you want to do something that's a bit more public and and, and not private you can go and do the macy's day uh macy's thanksgiving day parade with a ton of you know floats going around new york and then you can go check out like an american football game in person i think that that would be cool or you know if you do have american friends uh typically what people do is that the they'll be watching some egg ball all day and they'll just get lit so whether you're doing it in person or you're watching it with that family that took you in during uh, Thanksgiving. I think that that'd be super cool. Canada has Thanksgiving as well, but for us, it is celebrated in October. Uh, I think mainly the difference is because because of the climate in, in Canada compared to the U.S. For us, in November, it's not really. Uh, it can get cold, so I guess for us, October is more an appropriate time to to celebrate Thanksgiving. I think that's why we do it, but that's just my guess. 
Uh, but yeah, that'd be cool. I, I think, uh, you know, just tailgating, just American, American Thanksgiving would be cool. I, I, I would try, I would try to do this. I think they'd be cool. Just to see, and I think too, as a Canadian, it might be cool to to see some of the differences between the U.S. and Canada. Also, you guys have um, what's it called Black Friday too, right? That that'd be interesting. To, I I mean, it happens in Canada too, but it's just nowhere near as intense as the U.S. All right, so for December, the last month, we are going to do German Christmas markets. I fucking love these. So we found out that there was some near where I live here in New Brunswick in Canada and uh, the, the markets were in Quebec City and it was so much fun. It was like a like going a blast blast from the past to go experience living back in Germany. Uh, but the ones that I'm looking to highlight are not the ones around the world, but the ones where, uh, you know, the, the real ones. You, you can find them in most parts of Europe, but the main ones are in Germany, like in uh, Nuremberg is is kind of the, the main one, or uh, Braunschweig has been also uh, labeled as one of the nicer ones. Uh, Strasbourg in France has really a nice one as well, and Vienna in, in Austria, all bordering Germany, right? So interestingly enough, they've existed since the 15th century. Here you'll find all sorts of little wooden shops that are erected around usually city centers or city squares, and they'll be selling food, trinkets, and my fucking favorite, warm mulled wine. Don't miss this month long tradition. It is so cool. There's just something so cool about drinking in public that I love, especially when it's mulled wine. So check it out. That's my list, folks. I hope you enjoyed it and learned about some festivals around the world. If you want to keep these festivals as a reminder, I will be posting, I guess, a, a calendar view of, of all the, the events uh, on the Two Beers Still Take Off Instagram. So go check it out. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you for listening to Two Beers Till Takeoff. Do you want free additional content or just to stay connected with the show? Then give us a follow on our social media platform. That means TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all of them. Are you in need of podcast production services, video editing, or anything in between? Then look no further than Strut Sound Production, the official producer of the Two Beers Till Takeoff podcast. Music produced by Alex Gagne. Check out his work in our show notes. Voiceover done by Viking Leo K. See you next week on Two Beers Till Takeoff. Thank you